We're with Evelyn McDonald, uh, music critic, social critic, historian. Mm -hmm. Her new book is Queens of Noise, The Real Story of the Runaways. Uh, welcome home, Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it is. It's nice to be home. Yeah. 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 How long were you at the Herald? I was at the Herald for six years, and uh -huh. I lived in Miami for eight years. Uh -huh. I uh, went to a website um, for a while after I left the Herald. Um, sort of saw the winds of change <laughs> <laughs> and decided to pursue life in social media for a while. Yeah. And, um, and then I moved to L.A. for a fellowship at USC, um, and I'm still there. Uh, you uh, got ahead of the curve. Yeah, 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 I, I, I was. I was like, I'm not going to um, sink. I'm going to get off the ship on my own uh, <laughs> cord. Um, why uh, the runaways? Um, well, uh, first, I love rock and roll, to <laughs> paraphrase. <laughs> the uh, founding member of the Runaways, Joan Jett. Um, uh, and I'm always interested in women's stories. A lot of my books have been about women in music. A lot of my writing has been about women's voices. Um, so I'm always interested in women's stories. And they have one of the very classic uh, rock and roll stories but had never been told in its entirety. Uh -huh, um, uh -huh. There were legendary, <laughs> cult following, really devoted fans, never had big success in the United States, were huge in Japan, very popular in parts of Europe, uh, but left out of a lot of the history books, um, left out of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, all these kinds of things. So I really wanted to resuscitate their story because they were, they were pioneering. I mean, it was, the mid, it was 1975, they were 16, 17 years old, and there were no all-female hard rock bands. Or what about Susie glamour. Quattro? There was Susie Quattro, but she, the, uh, she left her sisters to go on a solo career and was performing with men. But yes, Susie Quattro was Joan Jett's primary influence. And that was it Joan, at that time? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, there was Fanny, um, and there was Isis, but they were not they were, were kind of different yeah. and they I mean, they were great not yeah. to disparage them yeah. um, and of course there were vocal groups of course they were supremes but there's nothing like the runaways so they really were pioneers so i wanted to resuscitate their story um and then also it's just it's an amazing story it's a coming of age story of young women in the 1970s post second wave feminism post title nine uh, trying to make it in the music industry at a very young age, surrounded by some dubious, if charismatic, <laughs> characters. Um, and also, you know, it, so it had great characters. Um, it has a, a narrative arc. <laughs> um, and then it has a great setting and time. It's Los Angeles in the 70s, you know, that's the Sunset Strip and um, suburbia and uh, so, so it had a lot of, it was a very compelling story. Uh, I had interviewed Joan um, s several times in the course of my career and had a tremendous respect for her uh, um, as a person and as a musician and uh, thought that this part of her story needed a better telling. Well, we, uh, we all know and respect Joan because of her solo career. Right. She wrote and performed some iconic songs. Right. Uh, but were the other members, were they really talented or were they more like the monkeys? Well, actually, um, Joan was, uh, when she joined the band or for founded the band, she and the drummer Sandy West were the first two members. Um, Sandy was actually the veteran musician compared mm -hmm. to Joan. Joan uh, had barely, you know, just playing rhythm guitar in her bedroom, whereas Sandy had been in a band. And Sandy was a pretty accomplished musician, you know, especially for a 16-year-old girl. And um, Lita Ford, the guitar player, uh, was an incredible lead guitar player. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I talked to their mm -hmm. producer, Earl Mankey, who had, you know, worked with the Beach Boys and Sparks. And he was like, when he heard her play guitar, um, he produced the Queens of Noise, the, the Runaway's second album. He was like, the, he, he knew, he was like, I knew, you know, middle-aged men who couldn't play guitar like Lita Ford. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to say, um, I, I'm not going to, you know, you didn't listen to the Runaways necessarily for the proficiency, but, um, you know, they were certainly as proficient as the New York Dolls 
or the right. Sex Pistols or right. the Ramones right. or the people that were sort of their, their peers. You didn't listen, you know, if you wanted proficiency, you'd listen to Eric Clapton and, and these acts were all a repudiation of. Absolutely. Yeah. The, there was a, there was a garage, it was a garage rock aesthetic. Right. So yeah. um, although Sandy and Lita um, actually were very serious musicians and wanted to be taken seriously, um, and I, you know, in, in some ways they had different, there's some different pulls on the band in, in that direction. Um, and then, I, and, and of course, it became like a. There's a feminist element to them not having been taken seriously that the Ramones didn't have to deal with. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, so people weren't taking the Runaways seriously because they were girls, not because you know, the Ramones were plain dumb guys, you know, yeah. which they weren't. But well, this was only a few years after uh, women in the anti-war movement weren't taken seriously. You know, they were. <laughs> Maybe right. get coffee, you know. Right, and they right. weren't taken seriously until they they started, the, you know, the feminist movement. So this is just past that time. Right, and 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 um, during their time, the Runaways uh, did not identify as feminists, and they actually said some pretty unfeminist things uh, or anti-feminist things. Uh, but to me, it's clearly a story of pioneers. A lot of pioneers don't admit that they're didn't have any political stakes. And Joan now, you know, has since um, been very outspoken about what they had to put up with and very supportive of other women. Well, artists. if they if they didn't embody feminism, they, they did embody an early version of girl power, though, right? I yeah, mean, it, absolutely. And Joan, uh, you know, later became a big supporter of the Riot Girl movement of the early 90s. She produced um, Bikini Kills, uh, a single Rebel Girl, and uh, you know the, the runaway. I mean, uh, the band Bratmobile covered um, the Runaways' "Cherry Bomb." So there's a, there's a explicit connection between their '70s pioneering and later '90s punk feminism, with the feminists that weren't afraid to call themselves feminists. When, when you were writing this, were you, were you, were you? Did you have behind the music in the back of your head? Did you want to try to avoid the cliches of that form? Yes, absolutely. Because even though um, I enjoyed the movie, The Runaways, that came out a few years ago with Kristen Stewart and Dakota Fanning. Um, I, I, there's a lot about that movie I admired. It did have a little bit of a behind the music kind of storyline. And this was one of the things that, um, and the, that movie is based on Sheree Curry's memoir, which is a really powerful memoir. And I really appreciate Sheree putting her story out there and telling the world the things that happened to her. Um, but both of those narratives really focused on uh, a lot of the drugs and sort of the sordid things and mm -hmm. didn't talk that much about the music. <coughs> so well, I'm not ignoring the other, the side <laughs> activities of the band. <laughs> I did want to keep the focus on um, what they accomplished musically and the, the tours they did. And the I'll ask you a question about the movie. Why did the movie X out the, the, the one girl, I can't think of her name, but the bass the player? The bass player, Jackie Fox. So they, they created a composite bass player. Because the Runaways did go through quite a few bass players. Uh -huh. Um, so they created a composite fictional character um, because uh, uh, Jackie Fox um, didn't want to cooperate with the movie. Was, had a lot of questions about the movie. There's a lot of um, schisms between the band members there were and there remain to this day. Uh, so, uh, and Jackie, um, after she left The Runaways, uh, became a entertainment lawyer. She went to Harvard Law School right, with right. Barack Obama. <laughs> yeah, so um, she knew, you know, she uh, sort of knows what she's doing in terms of law. So they just decided to avoid any possible, any you know, lawsuits. And actually, they ended up suing her for um, harassing them, which was um, the court. The case was thrown out of the courts, but yeah, yeah. And uh, Shuri Curry, how's she doing today? She's doing really good. She um, she was being managed by Kenny Laguna, who's Joan's longtime manager, who's, basi who's basically managed Joan's career since she left The Runaways, and had been managing Cherie for about a decade um, and made that movie happen. Uh, but I think that Cherie was being too much in the shadow of Joan in uh -huh, that relationship. Uh -huh. And um, she recorded an album that did not get released, and she uh, left Kenny and Blackheart and has struck out on her solo career. 
and it seems to have been a very good move for her. She's back on the road. She's getting a lot of attention. And I haven't seen her uh, perform, but the people have told me that she's really great, and she's been really great Still to work her with. Voice. She's, her voice is, is actually better than it, it ever was. Yeah. From uh, I've, some recordings I've heard, uh, she, I think she's um, in an incredible uh, point in her career right now. So, okay. yeah. Evelyn McDonald, the book is Queens of Noise, the real story of the Runaways. Thank you for being with us. Evelyn. Thank you, Chauncey. Yeah. <laughs>